Well, we're in this series called What the Bible Says About Race, One Race, uh, One Heart. And uh, we've gone to a lot of places this morning. Uh, we're going to open up a, a passage of Scripture. This is going to be from James. James chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open those up because we're going to go kind of verse by verse as we go through this passage this morning. It's a good place to mark up your Bibles a little bit. Um, but as you find that, or if you see it on the screen, uh, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless, and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there, or sit here on the floor by my footstool. Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who, have, who love him? Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you to court? Don't they blaspheme the name, the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself and are doing well. You are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you're a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. People of God, this is the word of God. You may be seated. You know, there's an outline in your bulletin, and that'll help you as we work through this passage this morning. You know, the, per the person who wrote James is the half-brother of Jesus. And James, uh, we know from Scripture, you know, didn't buy into all that Jesus was bringing initially. He was kind of a late, late cover into this. But boy, once he, once he came into it, he didn't miss words. And his words are very strong and very pointed as he talks uh, to his readers, his readers being us this morning. And he really lays it on the line. He gets in our faces a little bit when he's talking about our religion, our faith. And he starts calling your religion worthless if there are certain things that you do. He says, if you can't control your tongue, your religion is useless. Other translations use the word worthless. If you don't take care of orphans and widows, your religion is useless or worthless. So I believe that this applies to numerous things, and if James was here, he'd, he'd say other numerous things as well, such as the topic we have been talking about with regards to race. You can't accept other people who look different than you. Your religion is worthless. Some people could probably rise up, and if they were to talk to James today and say, well, James, aren't you judging people? And James would say, yes. Yes. You can see, if you call yourselves Christians, if you say that you're walking in the faith and you don't accept all people, well, then, you, then you're not walking with the Lord. Yes, I'm judging you. It's kind of like, you know, apple trees do not bear pot roasts. Corn plants do not bear peanuts. It, it, it kind of goes. It's a judgment that people can make. 
Christians are to love all people. They're not to choose some people and then reject other people. So yes, your religion is worthless if you don't love all people. Then James proceeds to give a good example. He moves right into the second chapter, which he didn't say chapter 2, somebody gave that later. But about Christians showing partiality to other people. And in the context of our our discussion, if God created only one race of people, we decided that already. It's very scriptural. There's one race of people, because there's only one blood, and we have all come from the same parents. So race is something that's human invented. No, there are people from different tribes and nations, but we're all one race. We're all just a different hue, a different color. Okay? And so we're to love everybody. Because we're all image bearers. Not some are image bearers and some aren't. We're all image bearers. And we're not supposed to show partiality towards anybody. And then, of course, the example that he gives, he focuses on the rich and poor, but we can certainly focus on the great, uh, the difference in colors. So what I want you to grab a hold of this morning is what we've been talking about for these last few weeks. And so there's things that come out of this passage that we need to take a, a, a look at. Look at verse 4. What does it say? It says, Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So we're to avoid distinctions among peoples. See, this is so easy for us to do. We start making distinctions with people. We start making judgments about people. And these are the kind of judgments I'm talking about. Don't trust those people. Those people don't work hard. Those people don't know how to do this or that. Those people all look alike. Those people speak funny. Those people eat strange things. You see, when we start doing that, we start making those distinctions, things digress quickly. And we can see the evil in that. We become judges. And not a person in this room would like to be talked about in that way. So James is saying, don't make those distinctions. It's evil. It's wrong. That's not for the Christ follower to do. Then he goes on, he says, avoid contradicting God's heart for people. Look at verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? See, you can take out that word poor and substitute anyone that is different from you. God hasn't provided distinction based upon those who would love him. He hasn't chosen them based upon the hue of their skin. God chose them because he was pleased to choose them. And dear people, let's not mess with people that God has chosen to pour out his love to. Could think about it. God says, I love them. He's our creator. He's the creator of all the I love them. So we're to love them as well. Don't contradict God. That never works out well. When God says love them, we better love them. It boils down to this. If we become ashamed of those people whom God says he loves, then we really are ashamed of God because of the choices that he has made. I mean, think about the gravity of that. When we harbor resentment towards people because of their skin color, and God says, no, I love them. I love them. And we say, well, no, they don't. Because they're different from us. You see how we're, we're showing the same to God who created people. And then in verse 6, look at this. It says, Yet you have dishonored the poor. Don't the rich oppress you and drag you into court. And I believe that this verse basically says, Avoid dishonoring fellow image bearers of God. What, what a great point that James is making here. And this is what we have to remember. God has shown me grace. 
God has shown you grace. And God has shown us mercy as well. And we don't deserve these things, but God has shown us. And if God has shown us that, then we are to show that to other people. You might say, well, everybody doesn't deserve my grace. Okay. Free country, you can say that. But then, did you deserve God's grace? I think the answer to that is emphatically no. And that must dictate our attitude towards other people. That's why we keep talking about grace around us. Like, when we wake up in the morning, we thank the Lord. We thank the Lord for grace. Because what we have is undeserved favor that comes from the Lord. And when we get it into us that, wow, this is a life filled with grace. I'm here because of grace. I live in this country because of grace. I have air in my lungs because of grace. My heart is beating because of grace. I have a home that's because of grace. All of these things are because of grace. That will dictate our attitude when we walk out into the streets and encounter other people. It's a grace-filled life. And people aren't always out there to show grace. And it's hard sometimes. I remember a story. We were living out in California. We had a neighbor who lived across from us. It just wasn't very neighborly. But we'd always just do it. Right? 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 And um, then they were going to move. Well, the time that they were going to move, we were doing a, a renovation on our house. So they had a big dumpster in front of their house. Dumpsters in California were dangerous because all the neighbors would throw their stuff in the dumpster. And people would get very mad at that, so I didn't want to do that make my neighbor mad. But one day, the police showed up at our house. They what do we do? This was a common occurrence. And the police came looking in our backyard. I said, is there a problem? And they said, well, yes, um, your neighbor has reported you because your neighbor says that you have thrown all of your renovations into their dumpster. <laughs> I just laughed. I said, you have to throw a thing in there. Well, they said you threw a bunch of stone in there, and it caused the bin to be too heavy, and so they won't pick it up. I said, I, I absolutely didn't do that. Well, looking at the backyard, certainly there's probable cause that you did it. So, anyway, I went over and talked to the lady. I said, ma'am, I didn't do this. She says, well, the next door neighbor, Maxine, she was our friend, but she was blind. She said she saw you. So I went next door to Maxine. I said, Maxine, when did you see us? Well, we, I, I thought I saw you on Sunday doing that. Maxine, did you ever see us working at our house on Sunday? Well, I don't know, but I thought it was you. And uh, so, anyway, long story short, it was, it was another neighbor down the street who... Oftentimes had a long nose because he didn't tell the truth. But this lady was upset at me, and she was set on the fact that it was, it was us. It was us. And I just couldn't have it. So I said, listen, what's the deal? I said, what are, what are they going to take to get this dumpster out of here? 75 bucks, and you're paying it. I said, okay. I went over, and I wrote her a check. $75 here at the dumpster going. It was grace. $75 that I didn't to pay, or $75 that I didn't have to pay her, and $75 for a relationship that wasn't really that very important to us because we were never knew each other well, but they left, and I'll never forget because I think she started to feel bad before they moved out. So she, she said, you go over to our garage and take out whatever garden things that you want. Well, they were all junk, and so I didn't show grace there. I just left that there for her. But, folks, there are things that are going to be demanded of us sometimes where we just need to do it. We just need to do it to show grace. It's not a matter of being right. It's just doing it. You just see, that's what God did to us. And we take that step. And we just do it. And then James goes on to say this. He talks about the great command of loving other people. And so what we're to do is we're to avoid doing anything that gets in the way of Obey the great commandment. You know the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. See, when we don't love people, we can't turn around and say we love God. It, it doesn't fit. And the Bible makes that clear. And so th there were people then, and there are people now that would literally show disdain and hate and malice towards their neighbor, but then they come to church on Sunday morning, oh, praise to you, O oh Lord. And God says, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't have relationships with people. You can't speak badly about people 
to their face or behind their back and then come in here and love me and think that I'm all happy about that. Nope, that doesn't work. And James calls that out. And then in verse 13, he says this, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And so we're called to avoid being merciless. Remember, God has given you mercy. I believe every day as Christ followers, we are living in a lifeline of mercy. Sometimes people ask the difference between mercy and grace, and maybe you've heard this line before. It's very helpful. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve. So when we look at mercy as receiving something you, uh, mercy is not receiving something you deserve. Well, what do we deserve? What do we deserve spiritually? Well, we deserve death. That's what we deserve. And what do we deserve on a daily basis? We deserve condemnation. And what do we get? What do we get when we're in Christ? Jesus says, you get light and you get it to the full. And into the eternal. And so what are we supposed to do to others? We're supposed to show mercy to others. And the way in which we can show mercy by God. It's very simple. It's not always easy to do. But it's a very simple concept. And then finally, what James says, and I have to go all the way back to verse 1, where it says, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in your glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Do not show favoritism. Avoid showing any contradiction of the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. So as you hold on to this faith, in our Savior, if you claim you have faith, then we're to walk in that faith. And if we walk in that faith, then we're called to love all people. Love all people. Love all people. That's what we're called to do. That's the church. This is where the church stands out. We love all people. And you know, in light of this, folks, James gives us a simple message about not showing partiality. And the only way that we're going to get there is we've got to practice it. And the only way we're going to get there is sometimes we have to take a step back into some of the sins of the past. So, this morning, in, in the few minutes remaining, I want to talk to you a little bit about lament. Lament. You know, I'm a person that's kind of prone to, you know, I want to be joyful. I want to sing songs and praise and and lift my arms. I, 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 I just, I get excited about that. And so that's one emotion. There's another emotion. There's another thing that we're called to do as Christians, and that is to lament. I don't want to dwell in lament all the time, but, but it's a necessary thing to do. I mean, we lament it as a church. I mean, when we lose one of our loved ones, we lament. It's appropriate to lament. That doesn't mean that we're not celebrating with our hope going to heaven, but we lament. When something bad happens to someone, we often lament and we just stop and we think, oh. And so, when we think about truly what lament is, and we know that there's a whole book devoted to this, the book of Lamentations, but a lament is a desperate cry. A lament is a request for help. A lament oftentimes concludes with a praise because we know our God is in charge and is gracious. I believe we are called to lament issues like racism. But some people immediately will respond to that. They say, well, how can I lament if I didn't do it? If I wasn't there during slavery, if I wasn't there in those events of the 1960s, I wasn't there putting my foot on George Floyd's neck this past summer. How can I do that? Well, folks, I want to tell you, it's, that's absolutely not the point. Lament comes from deep in the soul. You know, one third of the Psalms are laments. I believe that we all have reservoirs of tears in us that still need to come out in laments. See, I lament 
when people die in my flock. I especially do when people die suddenly or perhaps too early. I lament injustices that I hear in places. When I read a monthly publication, we get the voice of the martyrs. I just lament at the hardship that Christians are going through in different parts of the planet. I lament at times in church history when Christians absolutely behave badly. I lament when I read stories of injustice throughout history that relate to race. It has nothing to do with whether I was there or not. I think of the slave out in those hot cotton fields in the South lamenting where they were, what they were doing, and they were singing. And they were singing what we have called now Negro spirituals. It's interesting because in those spirituals, you'll find that they are done mostly in minor keys. And if you go up to the piano, they can be played on the black keys. Songs like Amazing Grace, Swing Low in Syria. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. So what do we really have today, church, to lament as it relates to racism? I think there's a variety of things. I'm only going to mention a few. But we lament. We need to lament the divided Sunday. You know, Billy Graham was the first to say it, and Martin Luther King Jr. repeated it. He said, Sunday at 11 a.m. is the most segregated hour in the week. That charge was made in the 1950s. And things haven't changed much since today. Only 20% of the church goers attend ethnically diverse churches, where one ethnic group makes up more than 80% of the church. This doesn't sound like God's vision for the church. It certainly doesn't sound like heaven. Now, I realize some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor, that can't even happen in Calvary. They should come to Calvary. You're right. You're right. But you get the point. You get the point. The, the church should strive, strive to be a church of all nations, of all colors. You know, in 1787, there was a free slave by the name of Richard Allen. He had purchased, he had purchased his own freedom. And then he joined St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Blacks and whites worshipped together. But they really didn't worship together. Because they had views that black people could sit in and that white people could sit in. And certain activities that black people would do and white people would do that they couldn't do together, including such things as prayer. And so Richard Allen became very discouraged by this practice. And so he left and he started the African Methodist Church. So it became the first independent black denomination in the United States. And this sort of thing happened in many other denominations as well because there was this opportunity. There was this opportunity for the United States literally to look like the city on the hill as it related to the church, that blacks and whites would worship together, and it didn't happen because white people wouldn't allow it. So thus, we started having all these independent black denominations that rose up that still exist today. It's a shared shame we have, folks. You know, people in America, in high amounts of people, fought for desegregating our schools because they came to realize that separate but equal would always be unequal. We need to fight for this within the church as well. And so we lament the fact that we live in a divided Sunday still. We need to lament the misuse of Scripture. I 
talked about this more in detail a few weeks ago, where over the years people have misused Scripture to justify slavery. And we remember how we talked again. There's no slavery in the Bible that is based upon color of skin. Okay, slavery is in a whole different context there. And people would use the Bible that there was some sort of a curse on Cain's, Cain's lineage or a, a, a curse that came out of the ark. And so, therefore, the treatment of African American people was justified. It's simply not true. It was a misuse of scripture. There are always, in our country, there are always going to be second class citizens. And you're going to find second class citizens throughout the world in different countries. You see, in so many places, slavery still exists. You look at the atrocities that are going on in the world. But folks, we're the church. We're the church. We have this. There are to be no second class citizens in church. None. None. There are no stepchildren in the family of God. We need to lament missed opportunities from the past. You know, slavery happened and it was a terrible injustice. It took a long time to remedy that in this country. But we're not there yet. It was a terrible injustice. The things that happened in slavery, the things that happened after slavery was abolished, the things that happened after slaves were emancipated, all the way up through the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, and still things going on today. The church had an opportunity to aggressively pursue the love that is talked about in this word from Genesis to Revelation, and to bring people in and to seek reconciliation, and they missed it. The church missed it in this country as they were writing together documents that all people are equal and have the right to pursue certain things. They missed it. The church missed it every day on those plantations. They missed it every day when they saw segregated motels and and, uh, restaurants. They missed it when they saw segregated drinking fountains. They kept missing it. This is the church. They kept missing it. And still, the church often is still missing it. There are opportunities here, right in front of us, to pursue to be someone different. And in a world that is filled with racial strife, and oftentimes the church wants to dive into that narrative, Let's dive into this narrative and be the church that God has called us to stop missing the opportunities that God's presenting for us. I think we need to lament misdirected missions. And I'm going to step on some toes here so you might want to look at people. I love all the people and places where we have missionaries. They're on the back wall of the lobby. We support them financially. We want to support them with our prayers, with our encouragements. I'm unwavering on that. I love the fact that we're talking about mission trips. I've been on some mission trips myself. Our family has been on. We're in conversations about a trip to Thailand. We're in conversations about a trip to Uganda. You know, What I found out, though, is in the United States, short-term mission trips to international places are a $1.6 billion enterprise in America. All the while, these planes are taking off from U.S. airports. They are flying over cities in America that are oftentimes really, really messed up. Where there is a tremendous amount of injustice going on, a tremendous amount of need that's going on, and yet we fly over them to other countries in the world. Interesting. 
You know, Martin Luther King Jr. said this, All life is interrelated. We are inevitably our brother's keeper because we are our brother's brother. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So when we go to other countries, we're going oftentimes into the governmental systems and stuff that are just really oftentimes just corrupt and mess a lot of things up and people aren't getting the resources they're supposed to get. We willingly go there to help. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But we avoid the cities in our country. We avoid the people in our country. And so here, as your pastor, I'm, I'm going to propose this. I'm going to propose that we don't go anywhere internationally on a mission trip until we do something the best of And then we find that city, and we get involved in that city. Maybe it's Des Moines. I don't know Des Moines well enough. I came from California. We have a head of ministry in Compton, California. And they're still involved in them. They involve the mission trip. So whatever it is, may we not neglect that which is right here, right here in our country, that needs so much help. I believe we need to lament our lack of remorse. As a church, we tend to reflect that which the culture says, and there is no sense of collective loss or remorse on our part. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because all the talk this summer with all the racist things going on, and you know, there's people that come up and talk about reparations, and as soon as people talk about reparations, White people sometimes they start going bananas. Like, what's the banana? What are we going to do? This? Now, some of you are old enough. I know you're old enough to remember this. Back in the '80s, Ronald Reagan was president. They voted, I believe, at least the United States Senate to grant reparations to all the Japanese families that were held in internment camps during World War II. It passed, I believe, 99 to 1 in the Senate. Boom! They all received checks, your money, without not a reservation at all. We've never done that. Huh. It just makes me wonder. We had the opportunity to get free homesteads to black families coming out of the Civil War, like we did to so many white families. And technically, it was supposed to be there for black families, but the bureaucracy and everything didn't allow for that to happen in many cases. And this is an issue that makes us feel uncomfortable because we want to say, when's it going to be over already? When's it going to be over already? Well, it's not over. And in the part of this, over the years, the church has sinned deeply. We have often gotten caught up in the sinfulness of racism. And so we often don't see the wickedness of racial profiling that goes on. We often don't see the wickedness of mass incarceration. And we haven't even looked into it to find out what it is that's not going so well. And we are so often being lied to by what we hear out there in the news. And then, of course, we know racism is all around. Because God created one race, one blood, the human race. The very idea of the gospel is that we would be one. That the world would know we are Christians because of oneness and because of love. You know, 9-11, many years ago it seems like, there was a great deal of lament after 9-11. There was lament because of the sheer loss of life that took place and, and the Twin Towers and those people who were killed in the plane crashes. There was lament because people came to the realization that it wasn't going to be some deep, dark country out there that was going to come after us with nuclear bombs. There were people that literally hated us so much that they hijacked planes and fly them into buildings. And we entered this era of terrorism. There was lament. Churches were left open during that time. People came in who had been in churches. Churches were filling up because people didn't know what to do with what was going on out there. Some of you can remember, too, the lament that took place after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and then Robert Kennedy, and then Martin Luther King Jr. assassinated. There was lament then. I believe right now we need to lament the state of division in our country the lack of truth being communicated. We need to lament the, uh, the ongoing corruption that continues to go on. 
listen to this. I read about this this week. In 2018, the Equal Justice Initiative unveiled a memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. And they were large tablets hanging from a square structure placed on a hill that overlooked that city. The tablets serve as a visual reminder of more than 800 counties. 800 counties where lynchings took place in this country. They were engraved with the names of all of those lynching victims. The hope is that the memorial will be a place of mourning and remembrance, a place to lament and possibly even to corporately confess. These are the kinds of things that must happen if we're ever going to get on and deal with a corporate theft of our past history. I haven't been there in Montgomery, Alabama, more than all. I don't want to see that. I want to experience that. Some of you have been to Washington, D.C., and you've seen the Vietnam War Memorial. You can't stand in front of the Vietnam War Memorial and see the 80,000 plus names and not live it. Because every time I have been there, there have been people there who have had loved ones who have passed, and they're there with their sketch paper, getting the name on that sketch paper of their loved one. You can't possibly not lament when you're in that place. This is important for us. It's important for us to do. Lament is powerful, folks. It's powerful. But in and of itself, it's not complete. It falls short of biblical re- reconciliation. Because biblical reconciliation always includes confession. And as your pastor, I'm not saying this is easy. It's hard. It's hard. And that's why we're talking about it. That's why we're opening up the Word. You know, tomorrow in the email that we send out here, and if you don't get the email, just let us know you can get the email. But we're going to send out some resources for Black History Month. I'm not putting a lot of books out there because people don't read books. I'm actually listing a variety of movies that I'm encouraging, and most of them are for adults. A couple of them uh, you can watch with your family. But it's important to watch some of these these films because what they do is they, they've always brought to me a sense of lament. I can't believe it. That, that happened. That happened here in my country. And it's good. And that's why we need to spend a little time during the month of February, Black History Month, because it helps us understand more what we're talking about here and how much we need God's Word to bring solution. John Perkins is a man that I referred to before. I have a high deal of respect for him. Hear his lament. Oh God, what do we do when the foundations are shaken? There's hate, distrust, and selfish greed. We're doing the wrong things with wrong motives. We're not one, and we are satisfied. Lord, open our eyes to see your truth. Awaken in us a zeal for your power and your presence among us. Break down the walls that have separated us. Help us love with your love. From the earliest of our existence, you, O oh Lord, have kept us. Your word has been a lamp and a light to our path. For all of our appointed days, we will serve you from everlasting to everlasting. You are our God. Let's pray together. Father of heaven, this is heavy. It's heavy on our hearts. Struggle inwardly as part of us that don't want to take responsibility for things that you weren't directly a part of, yet we know they're part of the shared history of this great country. Maybe there's been, maybe there's never been a negative word that's come out of some people's mouth towards anybody of color. And for that, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Maybe there's things that we haven't done that we know we should be doing. So I pray, even within our little community here in Iowa, 
that we would do whatever we can with your help to open our hearts to all people. I pray that we would claim all of the promises that are there in Scripture for one race, for one race, and that we would extend that love to that one race that you have created all in your image. And that that church would shine because the light of Jesus is shining to a church that desires oneness. Thank you for the family of God. Thank you for the tie that binds us. And thank you that truly people can know that we're being the church we're supposed to be because of our love. Brother, it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.